Hello, and welcome to uh, our very first philosophy and math mathematics course. And uh, we're very excited to actually be offering this, this one. And uh, thank you for all participating. And I just want to now uh, easily pass this on to our instructor for the class, John Bova. John. Hi. Uh, thank you, uh, Tony, for uh, doing the tech and uh, for joining the seminar as a participant. Um, thanks also to uh, Luca Fraser, who's directing the um, Media and Technology Program, uh, which we're currently hosted under at the new center. And um, to Tony again, Jason Adams and Mo Salome, the directors of the new center, for, uh, for putting this together. Um, I'm John. Um, can we at least figure out who's here? And then I'll talk a bit about what it is that I would like us to try to do. Um, all right, so, so to make this less awkward, I'll, I'll uh, say a little something about myself and uh, why uh, I'm offering this seminar. And then maybe um, the participants uh, could as well. Um, right, so um, I'm a PhD candidate in philosophy at Villanova University. Um, I haven't officially done uh, any higher education in math since I was an undergrad, um, but in the first couple of years of graduate school, uh, largely under the influence of discovering Badu around the same time as I think almost everyone in our generation. Um, I took a, a pretty strong turn back to uh, integrating uh, philosophical and mathematical interests. Um, there's certainly a sense in which you could say um, if, um, that the entire plot of this seminar is quite Badusian, uh, particularly today's uh, session, the very idea of bringing Plato and Contour together is, of course, um, recognizably Badusi, and this is how being an event begins. And um, I think I would argue that that it would be an even an even better book um, if it uh, stayed with that a little a little more faithfully throughout. Um, anyway, um, right. Uh, that's why I'm here. Um, what, what I'm fundamentally interested in um, and has given us the title of, of the seminar is thinking through what diagonalization is um, and the consequences thereof. Um, those don't, I think, nicely form uh, a sort of two-step uh, series in, in the classic style where you would first answer what is it and then answer the questions of its implications. Um, and here's where uh, we immediately start getting very self-referential. Um, it seems to me um, that it's only after diagonalization has started to have some consequences in our thinking um, that we're going to be able to recognize that uh, something um, conceptually has changed, that something has happened. Um, so that the consequences of diagonalization, working through them, are going to be necessary um, in a kind of circular fashion to retroact upon our understanding of what the thing is. Um, so that's why I'm not going to begin by defining diagonalization. Um, I'll just say that the uh, central thesis of my work um, so far um, in recent years um, has led me to um, a number of related theses. One of them is that um, contemporary philosophy is converging formally in a noticeable way on the kinds of problematics um, that can uh, be fruitfully studied from a formal point of view um, by isolating the diagonalization phenomenon as far as possible and uh, and paying attention to it as a topic of interest in its own right. Um, so that's why I'm doing so um, from noticing uh, this pattern um, in contemporary philosophy um, to that effect. 
um, the substantive side of that, as opposed to the interpretive side, is that I've become convinced that, that this isn't a mistake, um, that diagonalization is very important. And in my most serious or most jocular moments, I even have started to identify it with what Plato calls the former idea of the good. Um, and I'm, I'm at least partially serious about that uh, for reasons that, um, that we'll wind up talking about. Um, all right, C can I have, uh, if you're willing, some idea of who's here and um, why you might be interested in, in talking about this stuff and whether you have any experience in, in attempting to mix philosophy and mathematics uh, before. Um, let's start um, with my partner, Dresden Craig, who's um, hopefully going to uh, not always be a disembodied voice <laughs> in this seminar. Um, Dresden's been assisting me in the construction of the course, although, of course, uh, she's uh, in no way responsible for the outcome. Um, yeah. Uh, hi. Oh, I'm actually going to take my headphones out because I have a weird echo. Um, so apologies if somebody asks me a question and I don't hear you. Um, my name is Dresden Craig. I uh, have been um, having a very long uh, conversation with uh, John about a lot of the stuff that we're going to talk about in this course um, for several years now. <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in liberal arts from St. John's College in Annapolis, uh, where we delight in bringing things that authors that you wouldn't think talk to each other together and make them talk to each other. Uh, so I hope to be able to do that uh, in this course. I'll, I'll refer back to St. John's again um, in a moment uh, for the purpose of, of talking about how we think of a seminar and what we're hoping, uh, the kind of conversation that we're, that we're hoping to have um, under the heading of a seminar here. Um, of course, the, the platform and uh, all of that is new to us, so uh, it's going to take some getting used to. Um, any, anyone willing to go next? I can just go, because I'm used to this. <laughs> uh, I'm Tony Yannick. I'm one of the organizers uh, here at the New Center, but I'm also a graduate student. I'm doing my PhD at the University of Glasgow. Uh, I'm actually uh, doing research in <clears throat> in time critical media, new media, whatever you may want to call it. Uh, specifically, John and I have been talking about research that I'm doing on a film I'm doing with Primer and trying to understand the mathematics of recursion, systems theory. Um, so who's, there. Are, who's seen this film, by the way? If you haven't, you should. It's amazing. At Primer, it's a good film. It's by uh, Shane Carter's American film, made in 2007, I think. Yeah, 2007. Um, but yeah, so this this is uh, I'm just trying to wrap my head around a lot of these questions and in conversation with John, I found that there are actually a lot of things that I'm engaging with that that he's he can respond to uh, through diagonalization and some interesting r r resonances between second order cybernetics and uh, and some di diagonalization theorems. Um, so yeah, I'm just going to. to participate as much as possible. I also have a background in computer science, computer engineering, so I have some level of mathematics. But yeah. So I think we have uh, Evan, uh, James, Sarah, and Thomas are here. So any of any of those four that want to introduce themselves next, or you don't have to. Uh, hello. <clears throat> I'm Avon. Is this working? I'm yes. still getting used to the yes, format, too. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm a, a musician and a composer, um, and I'm naturally drawn to an interest in, in mathematics through, through that, um, trying to notate aspects of time uh, and duration has led me into thinking about a lot of these um, antimonies or, uh, you know, issues, I guess, and... But my formal background in mathematics is very, very nil, 
no, none, <laughs> um, except that I'm independently a researcher, you know, and, and uh, I've been interested in, I, I guess I was drawn into it by Badu again, um, so I'm glad you said that. Um, but I probably came to Badu through Lacan or other, yeah, through non-mathematical stuff. But anyway, I've been looking for a class like this for for a long time, and I'm very uh, grateful that you're doing it, and I really appreciate that, and I'll try my best. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, th this is a perfectly good moment um, to say something that I wanted to say generally, um, which is that um, it's really important to me in, in the name of having a seminar discussion um, that we don't um, just sort of keep politely quiet about anything that doesn't seem clear or transparent. Um, people come at this, with, or even, even in this group, uh, with a great variety of, of different backgrounds, um, but there's nobody here, I think, um, None of us are like hiding a Fields Medal up our vest or something. Uh, there's nobody here who is is so advanced at this stuff that they're not benefited conceptually by going over the most basic parts of it um, whenever it's needed, and it's needed whenever it comes up in conversation. Um, so please um, don't be shy about uh, asking the most basic questions questions um, or raising the most basic objections, the latter are pr often extremely difficult, so I probably won't be able to handle them at all. Um, but basic terminology and that kind of thing, um, just please don't be shy about it. Um, by the way, have you, have you run across this Mazzola book, uh, The Topos of Music, um, which attempts to uh, bring uh, not just set theory, but category theory and topos theory to bear on problems of music theory. It's it's an absolute monster, but it's kind of fascinating. It, it's a total monster and uh, I have that book and I'm 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 working through it, but I think it's a very exciting book and I'm glad to, to see uh, that that Reza also championed that that work. And I also think that Mazzola is a very interesting musician too, so that that makes me think it, it will be worth the effort. But um, yeah, I'm, it's, it's, it's great. It's the only thing like that that's out there. Yeah. So. And, and, that, and that would be a perfectly legitimate um, paper and or presentation topic, I, because I think you're, you're actually doing this for credit, right? I signed up for credit, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that would be a perfectly uh, apropos thing to, to work on. Uh, in general, that's another thing I wanted to say. In general, I'm... Uh, hoping to create a kind of uh, fusion of horizons between uh, this stuff that seems uh, maybe very unusual and specialized and, and maybe only directly relevant to, like, computer science people or something like that, and whatever um, fields, uh, at, to the extent that they are philosophical, but, um, people are working on uh, their individual projects in. Um, that's one of the major goals um, as I think about it uh, for the seminar, to try to, to rediscover what it is that at least I find exciting about diagonalization um, in each place where the concepts attain a sufficient level of reflexivity um, to make something like that possible. And music is, is certainly such a place. Um, it's hard for me to think of a place that would be a priori ruled out as just too uh, expressively impoverished uh, for something like that to happen. Oddly, certain kinds of logic that we're taught in school um, are like that, as, as we'll have occasion to um, mm -hmm. to point out. Um, but music is obviously um, obviously has the expressive capability for uh, for taking on problems of self-reference, problems of uh, of the infinite, etc. Um, okay, uh, thank you. Um, who's next? I will. Am I am I being heard? You are. Am, am I live? Okay. Um, so I'm Sarah. Um, I'm a computer programmer and printmaking. I still make art sometimes, but uh, these days I'm mostly programming. Um, the past several months I've been getting uh, more and more into artificial intelligence, and I think that is probably my life's project. Um, 
I'm writing neural nets now, which I'm really excited about. Um, so I think there's probably uh, probably some relevance <laughs> with what we're going to be talking about. Uh, in the, you know, formal system, because it's kind of a formal system that needs to look at itself and say what, what it can do. Um, my math philosophical background is kind of a mess. <laughs> I know things here, here, and here, and have gaps here and here. So, um, oh, I also uh, I read Gerda Lauterbach, and I'm really into pretty much everything in that book. So, uh, I guess that's one big reason that I'm besides think, being a fan of John's, of course. I think the I think the old edition of GB is looming above your right shoulder. Is that true? There we go. Okay. Yes. Yeah, this one's actually in in bad shape, uh, but we got another old edition. Uh, <laughs> all right. Um, I I don't know whether everybody um has gotten all of the texts. Everybody have access to the Google Classroom at this point. Um, if not, I'll just mention that um if you're here, you. Sh uh, qualify for access to that, and I've already posted um, a metric ton of texts, of which uh, another of Hofstetter's pieces, a bit more recent, um, called What Is It Like to Be a Strange Loop, I'm thinking of as being a sort of keynote. Uh, That's recursive. Yeah, you just muted yourself. <laughs> yes. Um, even though we won't... Uh, <laughs> explicitly consider that um, for another week or two um, when we actually talk about Girdle. Um, okay, so, yeah, right, just a reminder, um, check out the stuff on the Google Classroom page. Uh, thank you for that, Sarah. Who's next? Anybody? So I should say that James is here. He's he's an auditor. He's in and out, but he's decided he wanted to come in to participate when he can. So he might not be uh, when he's muted. He might not be actually here. Robert just signed up for our audit, so he's sure. just participating, like literally just when we started. Uh, and then Thomas, could you introduce yourself if you don't mind? You mute. You have to unmute yourself really quickly. You can do that simply by uh, up in the top when you're like mousing over the big picture in Google Hangouts. There you go. Yes. Nope. No back. Yep. I might not have. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, hi. Uh, my name is uh, Tom Elliott, and um, I'm uh, just uh, I, Tony. Uh, at the last minute, sort of invited me to come and just uh, sit in on today. Um, I, uh, um, I, like uh, many of you, it sounds like I know uh, a little bit about this stuff just from interest in Badu. Um, but uh, I, I studied some uh, philosophy of science earlier in life, and uh, I was very interested in probabilism. So I have a little <coughs> background in uh, statistical philosophy, I guess. Um, but uh, apart from that, no, uh, I, I definitely am, a, I don't know, hi, hi, mostly a Heideggerian and uh, um, in, into, you know, uh, that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, uh, and basically a math illiterate, actually. I mean, I can follow Badu when he's doing, working through the sets. He's actually such a gracious sort of, <clears throat> he brings you along so well, <clears throat> um, so that you can understand set theory, which I have no experience with, but... Yeah, that's about my sort of experience level with this topic. Uh, I'm just fascinated to see um, what's going to go on today. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, got voices outside. Okay. Um, so if anybody uh, joins us later and, and wants to introduce themselves, um, they certainly can. Um, otherwise, uh, possible outline for our discussion today. Um, 
brief reflection on the idea of the seminar and um, what it would be like to try to realize that in this uh, electronic setting. Um, has anyone not had a chance um, to read or reread uh, the dialogue Domino? Yeah, I, I gave it a I gave it a read over right before class. Cool. Um, so I think maybe we can start there um, and talk about a form, a, a different kind of diagonal, actually. Um, so we're not going to just uh, conflate the diagonal that shows up in the Mino with the diagonal of diagonalization, um, but we are going to um, eventually tease out a connection between them. Um, so the form uh, that functions so prominently in the background of, of the Mino, particularly in, in the geometry lesson, um, is I'm going to say the first and only um, instance of uh, a member of our series of diagonal or diagonal related results uh, to appear before the 19th century. Uh, so we'll have one click in uh, the uh, 5th century BCE, and then the next click will be uh, in the last quarter of the 19th century. Um, but anyway, um, I'm going to append to the sort of normal series of, of diagonal arguments um, this ancient result uh, that's in the background of the Mino incommensurability. And um, my view is that there's uh, a non-obvious uh, connection between uh, what happened to the ancient Greeks, philosophico-mathematically, and what returns and happens for a second time uh, only through Contour. Um, I think this is Badiou's view as well. O often I'm going to say things uh, here that I would be perfectly fine to ascribe uh, to Badiou if he wants them. Uh, on the other hand, I find um, that he doesn't quite say them uh, these ways, and the people who read him uh, often don't seem uh, to think of these things uh, the way that I do at all, so it's it's entirely um, um, up to you uh, whether you want to take any of this as, as original or not. It doesn't really matter to me. Um, then I think for the sake of uh, literacy and of making um, the stuff that we're going to read uh, through the remainder of the seminar comprehensible, I think we have to talk as briefly and compactly as possible about the development of mathematical logic roughly between Plato and Contour, so about 2,500 years. Fortunately, there isn't much of it until the 19th century, um, but we need to at least sort of make sure that we're on the same page with some basic syntax um, in order to uh, in order to inhabit a, a shared formal space. And then I would like us uh, to turn, again, seminar style, uh, to the counter selections that, um, that we read, presumably, um, that were posted, at least, um, and uh, to talk through those as far as we have time. Uh, there we will meet our first real live instance of diagonalization in the form of Contra's theorem. Um, I would like us uh, to prove it together in real time in a maybe a slightly modernized um, notation, um, and that'll give us a, a good chance to review the most absolutely basic parts of set theory as well. Um, so Contour, Contour's theorem, Contour the texts, Contour's theorem, um, and then to the extent that we have time, and certainly uh, spilling over into uh, next time as well, to start talking about the philosophical applications and interpretations of Condor's theorem that we get from figures including Badiou, um, but also Russell, Patrick Grimm, uh, Graham Priest, etc. Uh, Peirce, um, 
I, I excerpted, I don't know whether anyone has had time to read it, but I excerpted um, one of the earliest and still extremely interesting philosophical discussions of, of Contra's theorem, um, namely Charles Saunders Peirce's uh, reaction to it um, in the late 19th century, uh, part of a string of, of reactions to it, but this one is the most is, is the most explicit. Um, so Peirce actually belongs uh, up here even before Russell in terms of reactions to Contra. Um, ultimately, uh, what I want us to do is to have a strong intuition of what's operating at the core of Contra's proof, uh, the core of, of the proper, most general proof of Contra's theorem, um, this phenomenon that we call diagonalization, um, so that you can uh, start or continue, if you've already been thinking about this, um, to uh, pose your own uh, questions about its philosophical significance. Um, all right, so just briefly a word about what it means to me to have a seminar. Um, Dresden mentioned uh, doing her undergraduate uh, work at St. John's. Um, I did my first MA there, and it's certainly where my ideal of the seminar uh, comes from, which is possibly a little different um, from uh, how people usually think about uh, even, even a graduate seminar. Um, so what do we want to say about a seminar? Um, for us, a seminar is primarily a conversation, um, an active conversation among uh, all of its participants, um, all of whom have read a shared text, and all of whom are working toward an understanding of the same formalisms. Um, so uh, absolutely essential is, is to have done the reading and to actually sort of actively have the reading with you and in front of you and annotatable and that kind of thing. Um, the text is one center, uh, not of authority, but of focus and, and of um, a, a common reservoir of, of concepts. And the other one, um, the, uh, and I think it's important that there are these two, uh, the texts and the forms themselves, um, thinking of something like the proof of Contra's theorem as a form that exists um, not exactly identically with any of its uh, incarnations in a text, be it uh, Contours or the ones that we come up with or, or otherwise. Um, these two objects, um, if you like, I think of as, as being literally at the center of the seminar um, in place of uh, the authority of the lecturer supposed to know or the professor uh, in a traditional sense. Um, so I'm not going to uh, lecture generally. Um, I would like to hear myself talk, especially uh, when I start actually having ideas in real time, so I will not hide my positions on these matters, and I'm sure I will go off on many a tangent about them, um, but, I, uh, but I'm not a lecturer. That's just not how I practice philosophy. Um, so if you're... Um, if you're here, then it's my hope uh, that you'll join actively in the conversation, and what exactly gets said uh, will be determined by um, all of us in real time, um, and it will be a strange, uh, sometimes awkward, collective object. Um, but to me, that's the only way that uh, that thinking gets done, as opposed to, say, someone preparing a text in advance, reading it to you, that's very nice. You could have just emailed it and read it on your own. Um, there's no point in actually having to sh show up for that. Um, have, have I left anything out uh, about the seminar, about what a seminar is? Um, maybe say something about outside sources? Yeah, do it. Um, so we have, hopefully, <laughs> if we have time, these shared texts and these shared forms. Um, but of course, that doesn't exhaust our resources conceptually or textually or whatever. Uh, but um, it works best, these kinds of conversations work best if, if you're going to reference um, 
some other text that you've read or something, that you don't just sort of wave at it. You make its contents, its the argument, et cetera, present. So if you can... To the extent possible, to, of course. Right. I mean, no one expects you to be able to, like, quote all of being in time from memory or whatever, but... Um, uh, yeah, that's the only thing I could think of. Oh. It, yeah, and, and as I in, interpret, I mean, there are people who interpret this rule um, very strictly and very negatively. Just do not even bother mentioning something unless we all have it in common. And I understand the rationale for that. Um, we all do, I think, have a responsibility to mutual intelligibility if we're going to try and have uh, a conversation like this. Um, but really, I think of it um, more... Uh, positively as demanding a second step. So when you catch yourself referring to something that you think is really cool that the rest of us haven't read, do the second thing, namely explain it to us. Um, and any any thoughts about that or any other uh, procedural things uh, that anyone wants to talk about before we consider the Mino? No, I'm good. I think that was a good introduction. Okie dokie. Other people, uh, if you want to chime in and respond, don't don't feel shy. Um, I guess that's the only thing I would add to the seminar is that this is an open environment. You know, I'm going to be throwing out random crazy things as well, so hopefully that will help other people to do the same. <laughs> yes, please. And, and, I mean, we are at a disadvantage because we're not literally sitting around a table at the center of which is all of our copies of, of this text and a board that we can all write on in order to um, talk about the forms. Um, so it'll just take an extra level of effort and commitment uh, to having a conversation to, to actually make that uh, happen. But I think we can do it, or, or at least um, let's, let's make an attempt. So the opening question that I uh, posted with respect to the Mino is one place that we can start. Um, I'll remind you of that opening question. There's a certain notorious Plato scholar uh, who doesn't, whose name does not need to be mentioned, um, who in a very influential article called Elenchus and Mathematics, Elenchus being uh, a name for the Socratic practice of cross-examining and uh, thereby uh, exposing the ignorance of various interlocutors. Uh, you can spell it like this. You can also have a, a U there if you want. Um, Elenchus and, and Mathematics. Um, anyway, uh, the claim made in this classic piece which really irritates me is that uh, the function of the geometry lesson at the center of the Mino could equally well have been filled by any mathematical example at all, including the very low temperature example um, that anyone who's read uh, Kant's first critique is familiar with. Um, 7 plus 5 equals 12. Um, for Kant's purposes in the first critique, this example is, is sufficient, or at least he thinks it is. Um, is that true here? Or does the geometry lesson have a specificity to it that is integral to its function in the argument? That's a sort of central question that, that I would like to pose and to have out there. Um, we can pick that up right away if people have thoughts about it. We can also kind of warm up by just uh, more or less walking through the, the dialogue in order and pointing out uh, the things that, that you found most interesting or thought-provoking there. If I could point out that, that this, this is uh, like line 82 on page 12 of the document that you gave us. It's on 881 of the PDF that you gave us, but just referencing from the classroom. Nice. I believe, right? Mino says, yes, Socrates, 
But how do you mean that we we'll, we do not learn, but that we call learning is recollection? Can you lead me to this? This is right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, that that um, right there. Eighty one e. This is how you refer to your position in, in a uh, platonic dialogue because these numbers and letters are the same in any edition that you've got. They're called Stephanus numbers um, because uh, someone named Stephen. Uh, whose name was subsequently Latinized, printed uh, one of the first mass-produced uh, editions of uh, of the Platonic Dialogues. Um, so uh, when, when we're trying to indicate where we are to each other, um, you do it with a, num a number and a letter. Uh, so yes, what we would call, or, or what gets standardly called the geometry lesson, maybe that's not even a good word for it, um, happens there. Um, right after what we could call the myth of recollection. Which in turn comes right after the articulation of what's sometimes called Mino's paradox or the paradox of inquiry. So understanding this progression in the dialectic is obviously a proximate goal for us as well. If we want to understand this, we have to understand it at least in, in uh, the context of, of this triple movement. I'm also curious um, how seriously you take Mino's paradox or the paradox of inquiry. Um, many people, it seems to me, uh, at least when they look at it the first time, um, don't seem to take it very seriously and don't think that Plato Socrates is, uh, is taking it very seriously either. Um, that is uh, at about 80D. Mino and Socrates have gone a few rounds at that point. Um, really nothing compared to what's uh, usual or is going to happen later. But they've gone a few rounds um, setting up and knocking down putative definitions of virtue. Socrates insists that he doesn't know what virtue is. Um, and Mino, at a certain point, rather than just proffering another uh, definition, um, does something that is actually, in a way, I think, quite philosophically good. Um, he moves to a higher reflective level and attacks the very possibility of, of inquiry, uh, particularly in, in uh, the form of this particular pattern of Socratic questioning. Is it a serious problem? I, I'll just... Um, I'll just read it. I will read uh, a slightly different translation, probably, than uh, the one that I sent you. Socrates has just said, uh, So now, for my part, I have no idea what virtue is. Whilst you, though perhaps you may have known before you came in touch with me, are now as good as ignorant of it also. But nonetheless, I'm willing to join you in examining it and inquiring into its nature. Skepsis thai, looking, looking into it. Um, kai suza tesis thai, um, seeking together uh, into the TS, into the TS, into the question, what is it directed at virtue? Amina replies, but on what lines will you look? Um, what lines? Um, Tina tropon, um, whence all of our English words in involving trope. Um, so it's a, it's a question about a way or a direction. Um, along what lines could you possibly look for it, uh, Socrates? For a thing of whose nature you know nothing at all. What sort of thing amongst those that you know not will you tr uh, treat us to as the object of your search? 
or even supposing at the best that you hit upon it, how will you know that it is the thing that you did not know? Socrates replies seemingly dismissively, but I think that has to be uh, completely undermined by the fact that we have uh, then two high-powered digressions uh, problematically linked to one another um, by way of the real response. Um, but first he says, ah, this is an aristical argument, a, a captious uh, argument, a mere argument that a man cannot inquire either into uh, what he knows or into what he does not know. Uh, he can't inquire into what he knows because he already knows it. He can't inquire into what he does not know because how would he recognize it? Um, what do you think of this problem? How seriously do you, are you inclined to take it? It, it seems to me that it kind of depends uh, depends what what you're trying to know. Definitely uh, the geometry lesson shows, I mean, you know, so obviously you, you don't know what the answer is problem, but when you've got to the end of the problem, you know you've gotten it right because you followed, you know, to, you know that all the steps you took were right. So it seems like if it's if it's a formal problem, you can definitely inquire into it. If it's not a formal problem, like figuring out what virtue is, that seems like a totally different thing where you're really, you're not really figuring out what it is. You're kind of, you're almost making it by, uh, you know, defining, you're trying to define this word. It's, you know, you're not, you're not following formal step verifiable so I would say it's true that at the end of it, you you don't really know if you've found what you were looking for or not. You can be, you know, somewhat satisfied and decide to give up on it. Whereas a, a formal problem like the geometry problem, you you, you can know. So it's, it's a question to really extend. You can't say, you know, in, in a case it's, the problem holds. It depends what depends what you're trying to know. I got most of that. I think um, I'll, I'll so I'll just name the the Plato scholar I was talking about. His name is Gregory Vlastos. I think Vlastos' intuition is similar to yours, in that the suggestion would be okay. Um, we've really got two kinds of problem. Uh, formal or mathematical and non-formal or ethical or political or carried out in ordinary language or, or uh, necessarily involving thick concepts that don't have a, a precise algorithmic uh, uh, methodology that we can attach to them. Um, so w w I think one of the deflationary intentions behind uh, Vlastos' suggestion that you could just as well have used 7 plus 5 equals 12 is to say we have the impression that there's something fancy going on here, something that does more than, en than just any formal algorithmic example would do, but that's not really true, and you can't, in fact, um, appeal to such an example to get across this chasm. Um, that's precisely the question at stake here, I think. Um, because if Vlastos is right about that, if there is just the formal on one side and the uh, ethically or politically substantive on the other, and if there just is no point of intersection between them, then... Mino is essentially right, right? Because um, what was it that Mino was actually attempting to deny in the paradox? He certainly was not denying that we could add up... I mean, he's not Wittgenstein. He's not denying that, that we could add up a column of numbers that we had never added up before and get a correct answer. Um, that's not the sense of 
a problem involving the unknown um, that the paradox is intended to uh, to attack. So probably when we poke at Mino's paradox, we find that it's asserting something like this strict dichotomy. Can we characterize um, the two sides of this dichotomy any more precisely? I think algorithmic and not sense. I mean, non-algorithmic is not a great word, but I think that's the, you know, on the one side there are that anyone can follow that are well, no, that's not an algorithm is guaranteed to give an answer. Mm -hmm. Now it's possible that you could have a problem of that sort that doesn't necessarily have an algorithm. It has an algorithm that is not that is not guaranteed to give an answer. So I guess that's a problem. Yes, you could. Possibly. Would would you be willing to entertain the possibility, in fact, of calling that the third thing? So I like the idea of third things. <laughs> Could could you I mean it, like it's it's very simplistic means but could you just represent these as form and content? Signifier signified. Uh, these are all linguistic terms. Right, and and all right. What if what if um what if we were to put it this way? And I, I think Sarah's remark has already, um, where she put forward algorithmic as, as the criterion here, but then qualified that and said, but wait a minute, the notion of algorithm is interesting in as much as um, it introduces a difference precisely in, in this place. There are algorithms and there are algorithms. There are algorithms that give you an answer, and there are algorithms that don't give you an answer. Um, this is... Uh, this is um, very close to the heart of what we're going to call diagonalization. And what I want to suggest, I think, is that it's also operating here. Um, so, so in the 7 plus 5 equals 12 case, right, we can follow a rule and the result is that we get something maybe quote-unquote new in that we've never actually empirically added up these numbers before. Um, but in a deeper sense, um, we just get uh, a repetition of our, uh, of our presuppositions, the presuppositions that set those rules to begin with, right? So to the extent that we have a rule-governed procedure up here, we lack... Um, not any old sense of novelty, not empirical novelty, but we lack real conceptual novelty or radical novelty. Um, and on the other hand, to the extent that uh, we might have something like uh, conceptual novelty down here, um, say we overthrow uh, the government and set up a new constitution. Um, okay, here at the level of, of uh, ethical content, we now have actual novelty, but we've done so uh, not by a rule, not with a reason, um, strictly speaking, but by, by sort of suspending the whole game and starting up uh, something else. So, would you buy this? Mino's paradox, when we poke at it a little bit, is about the impossibility of conceptual change being at the same time radical and principled, where radical means something like we get something really new out of it, um, and principled means, nevertheless, um, we're able to speak in terms of having a reason um, to, to, to uh, explain the transition from A to B um, in, terms, uh, in terms that are rational, pun pun intended, and we'll get to the pun in a moment. Um, 
So maybe we could schematize Mina's paradox this way. If we're going from A to B, it seems that either um, we get a good arrow in the form of a rule, and then we never get to anything that is uh, radically different, or um, we do get to something uh, that's radically different, but then we don't have the arrow. We have a sort of leap in the dark. Um, I don't... It's important to me to make the following suggestion, and I would like to know um, what you think of it. This is... Mino's paradox is, therefore, an example of a problem that is itself immediately both formal and ethical or existentially thick or what have you. Uh, this can be posed as a problem of pure logic. Is it the case that the output of any rational procedure is ultimately just a repetition of its input? And it is also, as uh, the example of, of constitutional change shows, um, and, and this is no accident, right? We, we learned something about Mino's view of power politics, um, whether he's picked this up from Gorgias at all or not. Uh, we learned something about it through, through the dialogue. And it seems clear that for him, uh, novelty, if it comes from anywhere, is going to come from people like him getting into power and doing things. Um, that that is his ultimate principle of justification. Um, so the paradox itself, I would assert, is at once a mathematical problem and, and an ethical problem, um, is at once um, a formal problem and an ethical problem. And in as much as it doesn't just have to do with uh, the rote churning out of mathematical results, in as much as it's, it's different... Uh, what, what, would, what it would take to answer it in a compelling way is something very different uh, from the 7 plus 5 equals 12 case. Um, it involves a second-order reflection on what we desire uh, relative to uh, rational processes. Namely, we desire at one and the same time the possibility of rule governedness and the possibility of, uh, of interesting uh, novelty. Um, to the extent that it involves a second-order reflection on those things, it, deser it actually deserves... Uh, immediately, the name meta mathematical. So, if you buy this, um, which I think seems kind of reasonable uh, the way that, that we put it just now, you might find yourself saying almost inadvertently uh, that there are problems that are at once meta mathematical and ethical. Um, or even that the two investigations uh, may, at some level of generality, be the same thing. That's actually kind of the motto of my work, um, to the extent that I, I don't go in for isms, but I'm, I allow myself the one motto, metalogic is ethics, um, and metalogic and metamathematics uh, are, as we will discuss at great length, uh, are extensionally the same thing, just under two different names. Um, you could also call it the foundations of theoretical computer science. It's, it's all uh, essentially uh, the same thing. What do you think of, of this claim uh, that the paradox, at least, um, the, the, the skeptical challenge to inquiry, uh, occupies a place that is at once mathematical and ethical, and that, therefore, any response to it that satisfies us also has to occupy a place that is at once metamathematical and ethical. Um, does that just seem like I've drunk too much of my own Kool-Aid, or what do you what say you about that? I, I'm following you, I, but I'd like to I'd like you to comment more about how how the second order reflection is necessary from the paradox, the first move. Um, what, what, do you, what do you mean by second order reflection, actually? Okay. So, um, thank you for, for asking that. Um, I, it, 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 uh, I slid into an instance of linguistic inflation there. I shouldn't have bothered to say second order reflection. Uh, reflection is already second order thinking, right? Um, so uh, what I mean uh, in calling it metamathematical is just that it doesn't pose um, an ordinary mathematical puzzle in the sense of uh, here 
are a list of numbers tell me their sum, um, it makes an observation about that game. Uh, namely, that in some sense, that game doesn't lead you to anything new. It can't do anything other than repeat what's been built into it. Um, does that does that make sense? Yeah, that's... Uh, I mean, that's true, I think, uh, of logic and uh, of, like, uh, let's say, normal logic in, in, in many ways. The tautology. Yes. S say even more, if you like. Uh, yeah, well, I'm, uh, no, I'm just thinking where, where I got that from, but that, that sort of idea that new information or, or, uh, or the impossibility of originality, original right. or creative, yeah, uh, emergence, I guess, but, but, but that would be on the formal level, so the ethical level, um, I realize that Plato has introduced the dialogue with the ethical level and gotten to the formal level from that, so um, is, is that the key to to introducing what you're calling the second order reflection here, or I mean, does it have to be ethics or could it just be in, in within the formal level itself there's an sort of, of the meta-mathematics of, of that or the meta-logic meta Oh, can I, <laughs> can I jump in? Um, so I've read this dialogue probably, I don't even know, 40 times. Um, I <laughs> sort of wrote my senior thesis on it. Um, but one thing that struck me this time through is that geometry is all through this, oh, the whole thing, right? Um, it doesn't just happen here in this lesson with the slave boy. Um, so it's either just before, okay, so just after, uh, the geometry lesson, we, uh, Mina was like, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, it would be great if we could understand what virtue really is, but can we go back to my original question, which is, is it teachable? And then Socrates says, let's go forward with a method like that of the geometers, right, this method of hypothesis, whatever. Um, so, Inquiry in general, like how one goes about answering any sort of question, right, is at issue in this text. Um, and so even though Mino is asking about uh, an explicitly ethical thing, namely virtue, um, the way forward, or the ways forward, that Socrates keeps pointing out are all borrowed from mathematics, mathematical practice. Um, so he thinks clearly, he thinks at least mathematics can be some kind of model for answering questions. I suspect it's more than just a model, um, but I, I do too. I, I suspect that that at the end, even that distance between the model and what is modeled, as though what we were learning how to do uh, were to carry out ethical discourse in a rational way or something like that, and to do that we would appeal to some uh, general understanding of how to be rational, um, is that last gap that I actually want to eliminate um, in, in saying something like metalogic is ethics or metamathematics is ethics. Um, it, it's, I, I'm suggesting that, that we don't even need or want um, what we reflexively go to, namely the idea that, that if we're doing something intelligible, it consists in the application of a pattern to a particular instance. Um, there's, there's a more intimate connection than that, that I'm... Uh, trying to argue emerges out of the Platonic dialectic. Um, and I am going to argue that diagonalization gives us a, a way of, of understanding um, that sort of excessive uh, uh, intimacy between, uh, between two discourses that don't seem to have anything to do with each other. Um, nevertheless, one, one can... Uh, rather than thinking of it hylomorphically, rather than, rather than thinking of it as rational form applied to ethical content um, or something like that, uh, we can at least think um, of 
a lack experienced from both sides, where the lack experienced from uh, the logical, mathematical, or algorithmic side is, um, we could say for novelty or for emergence, um, we could also say um, for something like, like relevance, um, if the latter means something like a form that's capable of overcoming its own uh, imprisonment in, in, uh, in formalization, a form that would be capable of, of breaking out of, of, um, of, of the merely tautological, merely logical uh, context. Um, and what would be lacked on the other side um, is something like a principle. Um, I won't say a rule as though it were a rule of good conduct or something like that, um, but the ability to see the ethical or existential field as inflected towards or oriented towards um, a point of formality, as opposed to, to a hylomorphic model in, in, in which the form is, is, uh, is the cookie cutter and, and we're applying it to, to these various instances. So it's one on one on one hand. There's in one direction. There's the break, and in, in another direction, there's the reorientation or some sort of orientation. Something like that. Yeah. Um, so if the paradox itself occupies that kind of space, where it makes us dissatisfied with the mathematical side because of the danger of tautology or of conceptual sterility there. And it makes us dissatisfied with the existential or ethical side because of the danger of sheer pragmatism um, or, or uh, uh, what, what do the political scientists call it? Legal positivism. Um, on that side, where the only thing that we can say about uh, change on that side is that somebody acquired power and changed things. Um, if the paradox itself tends to make us dissatisfied uh, in a synthetic way with that division, does the specificity of the example used to overcome it, namely the geometry lesson, tell us anything about the structure of, of this space in which we might be able to get the formal and the existential uh, to intersect, however, however fleetingly. If it does, I want to suggest, it, it, if the specificity of the example does teach us something about how to do this, it is necessarily through its negativity through the play of the positive and the negative in it. So it seems to me that the geometry lesson involves getting to something genuinely ampliative, genuinely synthetic, by means of first leading the formalism that you've got to paralyze itself. In what way? Um, can we talk about the example itself? What do you, uh, what do you remember of it? Um, and does anything about it strike you as conceptually significant? I, know, I think we have a four by four square, right? And we're trying to double its area? Yes. Figure out the length of the side of the square. Yeah. Right. And it's a 
it's not obvious to me that significant about this. It is not obvious. So in that sense, it's already slightly different from adding up uh, a table of numbers. Um, we don't immediately have a sense that we know how to proceed. I suggest it may be possible even to strengthen that observation a little more. So we we all know uh, we all know how the the suggestions proceed, right? Um, Socrates borrows uh, Mino's uh, uneducated slave boy, um, asks him these questions about how to produce the double square. Um, what does he say first? He says that this double line double gives us the double square, which is an intelligent mistake in my opinion. Um, I mean, it's a form of inference that works perfectly well for a lot of things. Um, where it doesn't work, um, where verbal reasoning can't be relied on, is precisely in this place of the formal. Uh, it's precisely in the place that, that mathematics um, outstrips natural language in some sense. Um, but anyway, um, it's easy to see that, that the double line gives you the quadruple square. Then it says, all right, well, it must be it must be three, then. Again, an intelligent mistake, I think, in as much as if you're right that you've got all of the concepts loaded in that you need, then you could sort of proceed by exhaustion. If it's not over here, if it's not over here, then it must be over here. If it's not two, it's not four, then it must be what's in between, um, which is three. Um, the profound but also silent thing about the demonstration, I think, is that in rejecting the line of three, the slave boy really has exhausted uh, his language and has exhausted natural language. Does that claim make any sense? Sure, yes, for me. So um, it's not obvious on the surface of it that you couldn't just um, divide into smaller pieces, right? Um, but essentially, uh, that is, in fact, the case. If you've run out on the level of the integers, then you've just run out as far as um, the ordinary way of putting together names for numbers goes in, in this algorithm. Um, of course, we know what the right solution turns out to be, right? We need to take half of the quadruple square, so we divide each of those in half, and we get that the double square comes from the diagonal. I submit that the fact that this is discovered before a name is put to it is of conceptual significance here. The naming of the diagonal in the geometry lesson proceeds backwards from the way that other numbers are, are named. Um, other numbers are named from out of a repertoire of word symbols, and they're sort of thrown at the problem and found to be inadequate. Here, something structural emerges from the problem, and we find that there isn't actually a place set out for it in advance in the language. So that the question becomes, how, it, how is that possible? If, the if Mino's paradox were correct, that experience, that particular experience, is what shouldn't be able to happen. 
it's not just that you shouldn't be able to uh, add up a table of numbers into a new sum. It's that the indexical relation, the slave boy points to it and says that, and the naming relation, Socrates says, the geometer is called as the diagonal, so let that be totally arbitrary. Uh, you, uh, you know, slave boy, then say, if that's the right name, uh, that the double square is built on the diagonal, or whatever we agree to call it. Um, so the relation uh, between identifying the thing and having the place set out in language in advance is reversed here. Do I seem to you to be claiming too much about the specificity of the example? Here, the thing precedes its name, which also means precedes the place that has been set out for it in language. So the question becomes how is it that, that we are able to construct it at all, that we are able to know it at all? And how do we recognize it when it arrives? Are you, I, I missed a minute, the name that doesn't uh, exist yet is the diagonal, the name of the diagonal, or did I miss something? So, implicitly, the problem is that Mino's slave presumes that he has, it presumes quite, quite commonsensically, that he's got the names for all of the magnitudes in advance, right? Because he knows how to count. It doesn't occur to him, um, it can't occur to him yet, because he has no conceptual alternative, it can't occur to him that that's actually um, a highly restrictive thesis, uh, that the number names that he can construct in that way are precisely the ones that we would call the rationals. He's got one, two, three, and he's got the things that you can do to one, two, three, uh, et cetera, um, to break them into larger or smaller parts. What he doesn't have is the irrational, or as the Greeks would have called it, incommensurable. Incommensurable, having no common measure. So what the uh, geometry lesson relies on, I think, for its conceptual power is this relation to the incommensurable. So the, the basic fact here, the basic theorem, is the side and the diagonal of a square are incommensurable, meaning they have literally no common measure. Is this all painfully familiar, or should I unpack it a little more? Um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, I please go on, it's, it's great. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. That, that's that's the feedback I needed. Um, all right. So instead of saying a common measure, a perfectly ordinary uh, term that would be just as good that you could use is a unit. And we're getting, if, if we want to speak Badusian about it, we're, we're getting already into uh, the question of the relation of the one uh, to the totality of what can be presented in, in a situation. But put, but put that aside. Um, so a perfectly ordinary assumption would be that given the side and the diagonal, there would be some unit, call it n, that could be used to measure both of them exactly. 
it seems perfectly reasonable um, because these things exist together. They exist in the same world. Um, it seems that uh, there should be a unit sufficient to count both of them at the same time, and in that way to formally ratify their coexistence, if you will, uh, to make their coexistence intelligible. Um, you could say there are, there are uh, a, a certain number uh, K of these units going this way, and there are a certain number L of these units uh, going this way. Um, in fact, this is impossible, <laughs> and that's what's meant in uh, contemporary jargon by saying, as we say much too quickly, that the square root of 2 is irrational. Irrational, what does it mean? It literally means having no ratio, right? Um, it means there is no ratio that you can say uh, using ordinary number words uh, that will define properly the relation between the side and the diagonal. Or if you want to put it differently in terms of a problem of regress, um, you could say no matter how small you make the unit, it will never suffice to measure the side and the diagonal both. Um, is everybody f familiar with the proof of this? Has, has anyone uh, not seen the actual proof of this before? I'm not familiar with the actual proof of that. Thank you. I, I think it's worth uh, recollecting. So I'll do it very quickly. It can be since we have um, the notation of modern algebra. It's quite uh, it's quite a quick proof. Um, but I will then also try to translate um, back into a more geometric, more Greek intuition of what's going on here. And it's in the translation that the connection to our later forms of diagonalization will, I think, become evident. OK, um, so first thing to notice is that like, I would say, all of the interesting proofs that we're going to consider in this family, and this is one of the things that, that made me first think about treating them, tr treating this incommensurability as a member of the diagonalization family. Like all of them, this is an instance of proof by contradiction. Also known as reductio ad absurdum. And I think someone posted the Greek to uh, the sidebar already. Um, so how, in general, does proof by contradiction work? Um, we want to show uh, a certain thing. We assume the opposite. Uh, so we want to prove P. We assume not P. I'll introduce a notation for negation here right at the outset. Not P or not P. Um, we show that that leads to a contradiction. Here's your contradiction sign. Um, sign Folsom. And we conclude P. Um, the philosophical controversies over the legitimacy of proof by contradiction are non-trivial, and they will eventually take us uh, to the point where we can really think about the difference between set theory and category theory and what the trade-off is um, between them. Um, roughly, to, to, to uh, just put a really bumper stickery um, sort of bookmark on it, bumper stickery bookmark, that's terrible. Um, Nevertheless, to do exactly that, um, the presence of proof by contradiction is a, a characteristic of classical logic, whereas the logic that emerges naturally from out of category theory is intuitionistic. Um, and we'll have occasion to talk about what that means, but one of the primary things that it means is that you're not allowed uh, to uh, get this. All, 
all that the intuitionist says you're allowed to get from this is not not p, <laughs> which the intuitionist uh, denies is equal to p. Um, we'll talk about all of that, but for now, uh, doing classical geometry, we'll do it with a classical logic in a classical context. Um, so the only difficult part of this proof is stating uh, what the target for reductio actually is. Um, what do we want it to be? We want it to be that the square root of 2 is a rational number. What is a rational number? Someone tell me. Some of the form m over n. Yes. Does that cover it? <laughs> yes. A rational, a rational number is anyone that can be written in the form a over b. Uh, where A and B are uh, both natural numbers. In other words, numbers of the form 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. And B is not equal to 0. Anything uh, that can be expressed in this way is basically a ratio of our ordinary counting numbers. Um, and therefore, uh, if we know what division is, namely just chopping something up, the place for all of these is set out as, in our language as soon as we have uh, the ordinary counting numbers. Um, so if our hypothesis for reductio is just that the square root of 2 is rational, and, and I, I uh, I half apologize to any of you who have done this proof a million times, but only half because I want us to look at it from a slightly higher conceptual level than usually um, one uh, tarries enough to notice. Um, so the hypothesis would be uh, that there is some number, A over B, and therefore some pair of natural numbers, A and B, such that A over B squared equals 2. Right Now, thank goodness, um, we can easily do a bit of algebra to it and save time. Um, that gives you a squared over b squared equals 2. a squared equals 2b squared. Right? So here's the first point at which one pauses and actually has to notice something. If a squared equals 2b squared, what can we say about a squared? It's even. It's even, because it's 2 times something. Now notice that we have two basic patterns when it comes to evens and odds. And whenever, philosophically, whenever we start talking about the even and the odd, the Pythagoreans are in the background. And they are in the background here, because what is going on here is actually the self-annihilation of the Pythagorean thesis. The Pythagorean thesis is panta arithmos. Everything is number. And by number, they meant natural numbers. So the Pythagorean thesis as a practical program is we can understand nature in terms of the relations of natural numbers. Um, the great thing about this thesis, uh, the thing that, that uh, strikes me as so pregnant for thinking about the relation of mathematics to dialectic as a whole, is that this thesis is capable of undermining itself. Uh, I mean, it is, in its original form, it is a mystical or, or religious thesis as much as a scientific one. But unlike every other mystical or religious thesis, this one is capable of, of, of uh, rigorously exploding in such a way that uh, that no one can fail to, to notice the fact. And this doesn't happen uh, with, with any other form of dogma. Um, but anyway, uh, the evens and the odds, just note um, if you have an even number and you square it, the result is even. Evens squared are even, right? Um, which is to say, if you've got a little box here that can be cut evenly in two, and you build a square on it, if you have a line here that can be cut evenly in two, and you build a square on it, the box can be cut evenly in four, right? Um, odds squared, on the other hand, are odd. If you want to take the time, you can actually uh, prove that easily algebraically as well. Let's just do it in the odd case. An odd number is something of the form 2n plus 1, where n is a natural number. Square it, what do you get? You get 2n squared, which is even, plus 2n, which is even, plus 1. 
so it's odd. And you could do the same thing in the even case and show that it's even if the diagrams didn't make it uh, perfectly obvious. What, what the diagram for an odd number being squared would look like this, right? You've got n, n, 1, you square it, and then you've got an n squared, n squared, n squared, n squared, n, 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 but you've got 1 in the middle. Um, there's a, an, an occupied square in the middle, whereas here uh, there's just an unoccupied grid line. Um, this question about uh, grid lines is uh, one of the most beautiful ways in which an obsession of Greek mathematics returns quite recently uh, in this case, in the form of the uh, unsolvability of Hilbert's 10th problem, which was only uh, successfully proven in the last 30 years or something like that. Um, more on that when we actually get to, to real live diagonalization. Back to the proof. So from A squared is even, we can conclude that A is even. We said that an even, is this still legible? Still yes. Legible? Yes. Okay. yes. Thank you. Um, a is even. We said that by definition, an even number is one that can be written as two times a natural number, right? So call that number n. We'll say a equals 2n. And then we'll just rewrite this with that substitution and get 2n quantity squared equals 2b squared. 4n squared equals 2b squared. Cancel here. 2n squared equals b squared. If 2n squared equals b squared, what can we say about b? b squared is even. So b is even. Now, That's actually it. From the fact that A and B both have to be even, you've got your full contradiction. Why? Because if A and B uh, were actually real, and if their ratio were an actual rational number, then you would be able to do what I should have written as, as uh, the little tag at the end of our hypothesis for reductio, but I'll just do it now, you should be able to write A over B in lowest terms. Which is to say, you should be able to divide out common factors until you get to a point where A and B have no common factors, and then just rename those the real A and B. If you can't do that, if there is no floor to this process, then we are dealing with some kind of infinitely descending sequence. Where, to the extent that we imagine A and B existing, we have to imagine being able to divide twos out of them forever, without end. So the infinite shows up immediately in this example. It would show up, um, it, so uh, I won't take the time to try to do so on the whiteboard, but I can send this to you. Uh, we can translate every step of this algebraic proof into the construction of a new diagram in which we search for, uh, in which we attempt to identify the unit that would measure the side and the diagonal at the same time. And what happens is that the diagram reproduces itself at a miniature level each time. So you wind up considering this square, and then you wind up considering this square, and then you wind up considering this square, and this one, and this one, and this one, and you have visual infinite regress, which of course strikes any good uh, Greek philosopher with a feeling of awe akin to horror, um, because uh, this just, this is something um, that is, in a way, formal. We're doing it uh, purely mathematically, but it is not form in Aristotle's sense. It is not form like the form of a horse or an apple or even those uh, semi-legitimate abstract forms like circles in Aristotle. Um, this is a, a form that rather than producing 
something thing like um, produces all these categories that that more recently we, we might think of as as sublime rather than as as beautiful. It produces an abyss. Um, so. One way of thinking about what's happening here is that the common measure that we keep trying to zone in on here um, falls through the mesh of any grid, whether we call it Pythagorean or call it Cartesian, it falls through the mesh of any grid no matter how small. This is, again, we're not describing anything more... Uh, outre than the fact that's already known to all of you that the square root of 2 is irrational. But we're doing it from, I think, a slightly more modern perspective than is usually brought to bear on uh, this elementary fact. And, and we're tarrying with it in a way that we can start to see its metamathematical texture. One other way to do that is to consider the positive case. So... Trivia question, what is arguably the earliest decisive example of an algorithm for, I, I don't know, all right, uh, addition or, or have something like that. But, all right, forget that. Um, what's the oldest algorithm that you can think of? Greatest common measure algorithm? Sorry, let me back. I'm not facing the microphone, so I probably Sorry. can't hear that. Uh, there's an algorithm given in Euclid's Elements for finding the greatest common measure between two numbers, numbers. or magnitudes. Yeah. Right. So, um, and, and this, this is even taught in, in computer science courses sometimes as, as being, like, grandmother of algorithms in the West. Um, we have what's called the Euclidean algorithm. And basically, it's a means for finding, we called it the greatest common factor, but it's exactly what we were talking about a moment ago as the common measure. Or the unit by which we can, starting from that unit, express both one thing and another, one number and another, um, in terms of, of a, a common, uh, I can't say it without just using another synonym, um, but, but uh, fr from, a, from a mathematical perspective, right, this is a way of sort of verifying the two things inhabit the same world, and that we're able to get back to the common principle uh, from which both of them flow. Um, so uh, Euclidean algorithm is, is very, very simple. If you... Uh, had, um, I don't know, I'll probably screw it up, but uh, what are you trying to think of? Hmm? Suddenly only thinking of primes, <laughs> which is not helping. 32. But, but, but still, okay, okay, yeah, good. And no, it's, that's the power of two. That's going to be, that's going to be, okay. Oh, all right. 34. And, no, that one. Hmm. <laughs> all of a sudden, I can't think of numbers. Um, all right. 36 and 24. 36 and 24, okay. So, um, incredibly simple algorithm, all you do is keep subtracting uh, the lesser from the greater. Um, so, in this case, 36 minus 24, you get 12. 12, then, uh, you, you lose uh, the greater, keep the lesser, this becomes uh, your new pair. Um, subtract uh, 12 uh, from 24, you get your 12 back, so you found your common measure, as anybody who remembers multiples of 12 knew anyway. Um, the point is, this is um, one of the earliest, maybe the earliest example of an explicitly given algorithm in 
mathematics in the West, and the proof that we just gave, namely that the diagonal and the side of the square are incommensurable, can be looked at in retrospect from the slightly odd angle that we've been describing it at as a case of non-halting or non-termination. Which, as Sarah mentioned, which is going to be uh, crucial to talking about diagonalization, um, these are uh, essential possibilities for algorithms as such. So one reason that we should think of this example buried deep in the context of the Mino, but operating essentially there, pardon me, I think, um, bearing on these questions of conceptual novelty, bearing on the possibility of knowledge of knowledge and knowledge of ignorance, the, these uh, meta-level questions that, that Socrates is always posing and that exist in, in the immediate environment of the questions about the good. Um, another reason why I think metalogic is ethics. Um, anyway, uh, this example buried at the heart of the Mino um, about the diagonal in the sense of the diagonal of the square can be regarded as an instance of what full-blown diagonalization is going uh, to show us, namely that uh, the negative formalism that uh, grasps these sort of liminal phenomena um, can take the form of uh, knowing when we're lucky or undergoing, as we are necessarily condemned to be most of the time, uh, that a particular algorithm does not terminate. Um, so even though, um, and I hope the thesis doesn't seem only historical, um, even though talk about non-terminating algorithms, the question of whether we can know whether an algorithm is going to terminate or not, uh, we'll do it in a couple of weeks. Um, it depends for its currency on uh, on post gradelian work, on the, the formulation of a Turing machine. Um, and yet, um, and I, I hope this uh, justifies somewhat collapsing uh, the distance between Plato and all of this stuff, um, an instance of it is operating essentially um, at the heart of the Mino. It's not just a matter of, uh, of similarity of terminology. Uh, between this diagonal and diagonalization. Any um, any response to that? I've been talking way too much. Uh, this is not what I think uh, a seminar is, but um, nevertheless, uh, any pushback on that? I think James actually on the sidebar wants to, to you to reiterate what you said about po you said post Turing machine. You said post another thing right before that, and I also missed it. Oh, yes, um, right. So uh, our current concept of an algorithm comes from Turing's work. Um, Alan Turing gives us the Turing machine, which is the conceptual prototype for the digital computer, um, and also gives us the most uh, basic question that we can ask about a Turing machine, a piece of hardware that's running some software, um, namely, uh, does it stop. The undecidability of the halting problem is one of our uh, main consequences of diagonalization that we will get to as a lemma, as a consequence of the even more fundamental instance uh, that Gödel gave us in uh, the form of the first incompleteness theorem. Um, really, uh, all of this is is a lemma of incompleteness. So uh, when we do the Hofstetter, uh, we'll be in a position to spin off in rapid succession uh, these lemmas, Turing's, Tarski's, Chaitin's, etc. Um, all of which involve proof by contradiction, all of which involve um, negative knowledge, and all of which I would even say in, involve the same um, slightly anxious distribution of negative knowledge that we observe in the Mino case, right? Um, so on one hand, 
uh, in the particular uh, geometric example in Amino, we're very lucky. Um, we have an algorithm for getting knowledge, for making commensurability out of the world, namely the Euclidean algorithm. It fails. It goes into an infinite loop. It does not terminate. But we can leap out of the system and see that with a relatively straightforward algebraic proof. Um, that sort of assures us that there is a place that we can sometimes be lucky enough to stand that we might want to call something like knowledge of ignorance. But it should by no means be globally reassuring um, because uh, one probably has the sense immediately and, and should that our ability to catch sight of what we do not know there um, if, effectively with a measure of good luck outwitting the paradox um, is by no means um, something that, that uh, we've done uh, through, say, the operation of a meta-algorithm or something like that. Um, so meta-mathematics or meta-logic would not be the restoration at a higher level of the assurance that we have effective procedures for surveilling our effective procedures. Um, it would not be the reassurance that we have a power um, to decide questions about our knowledge and ignorance at a second order. Uh, it would be quite the opposite. It, it, it would be participation in some generally bad news about our ability to do those things, which nevertheless at times admits of local exceptions. This is one of them. Um, something like the proof of the first incompleteness theorem is going to be another. Our proof of contrast theorem, which I begin to uh, fear we might not even get to tonight, um, is, is certainly um, Another. This this third this third place um, that we might want to identify with something like knowledge of ignorance. That is between just knowing what you know and churning out the mechanical consequences of it, and just not knowing what you don't know and having absolutely no way to get there. Uh, this third place is kind of unstable. It's kind of liminal, and the results that let us uh, inhabit that boundary point fleetingly, uh, even if only for a short time, are um, are kind of transient and, and uh, I find um, kind of uh, precious for that reason. Um, it, it's a it's a door that doesn't stay open. Well, um, all right. Question. Um, two questions. A, uh, do people want to say more about the Mino? I would be glad to, to stay here all night and talk about the Mino. Um, and who has actually had a chance to read the Contra primary sources? I've read some of the Contra. I read the diagonalization part. Uh and I read some evidences, did not get through the whole thing. OK. I would be fine with Plato all night. <laughs> <laughs> as much Plato as possible, yeah. <laughs> well, do, do you want to say anything about the Mino? <laughs> oh, no, not, not me. I'm totally fascinated, though. It seems there's so much, um, I don't know, I was reminded of fractal geometry. I, of course, don't know a whole lot about it. but. Uh, the image of the abyss that you brought up yes. uh, and the horror of it was just so beautiful. I, if you could talk more about retread some more of that uh, and how exactly how that's horrifying, uh, I, any of that is would be beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so um, I mean, this is I don't usually go in for the ancient modern distinction as being a useful one. Um, partly because of, of the kinds of connections I, I want to make between Plato and, and this post-Cantorian stuff. Um, but here, one has to admit, I think, that the sense that these uh, quasi-forms are uh, not real forms or are somehow disturbing, uh, Badu would say they, they present us with, with the anxiety of the void. Um, that's, um, that's, that's at least a real characteristic of, of, one has to admit, of, of all 
classical philosophy. Um, the fact that I want to name something like uh, this form as the good obviously puts me in a, a really awkward position relative to that uh, that whole Greek style of intuition where in order for a form to be good it should be sort of definite and, and bounded and uh, limited. Um, I think there are, are resources in Plato for resisting the finality of that identification and even for showing that uh, that talk of the good demands um, an expansion of uh, of what counts as good forms, um, but I'm I'm aware that I'm on on uh, troubled ground there, even even with respect to Plato. It's it's certainly not a matter of saying um, that Plato thinks this, that that Plato thinks that diagonalization is the form of the good or something like that. Um, that that would be unsupportable. A because he just doesn't know what diagonalization as such is, and B, because if he knew, he would probably be very disturbed. Um, that's one of the symptoms that, it, that it's so interesting to trace, um, even with Contra and Gödel themselves. Um, one of the reasons that, that I think we can think of diagonalization, um, again, in an unavoidably self-referential way, not just as giving us um, the schema of the Badusian event, but also as being an example of a Badusian event, um, is that uh, it produces only in retrospect the philosophical concepts that would have been necessary to receive it in a friendly way. You don't see that with Contra and Gödel. Their own reaction to what they have done is by means of classical concepts. They have no, they have no way of immediately making friends with what they've done. That requires a whole rethinking of what it was that we wanted out of systems. Um, out of systems of rationality, out of formal systems, and maybe even uh, out of philosophical systems. Um, so, what we need to do uh, to proceed in order is to talk about, as briefly as possible, the development of mathematical logic. Um, Frege plays an important role there, and to make sure that we all have the syntax of that in common, and then um, to talk about the contra primary sources and to prove contra's theorem together so that we get a genuine instance of diagonalization on the table in common, um, and can ask about uh, the related but distinct interpretations of people like Badu, Priest, Grimm, uh, of it. Um, what time are we supposed to end this session? We do have it scheduled for 9.30, but we started 15 minutes late, so 9.45, I think, is what we should shoot for. Okay. Um, so that means I've got 45? 45. 45. 45. I, I mean, if people want to stay, you, could, you, you can do the hour. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Anything else anyone wants to point out about Mino, by the way? Uh, <clears throat> I, I would. I'd really like to get on to the Cantor too, but uh, I, my question is just about the um, when you say that uh, it's it's not the emer uh, emerging power of a higher order that decides the the algorithm, the unsolvable algorithm. Um, uh, well. What am I? How can I form this? It, I, I guess uh, the the question of dimensionality. When I look at the form of the visual infinite regress, I think uh, of dimensions emerging, and when you go to the diagonal, it looks like a third dimension has emerged from the from the the flat square. Yes. Uh, so d does that new dimension somehow constitute uh, a higher order? another order, another terminology, and another framework for, for the knowledge that we have of the earlier dimension, or something like that? Um, I think so, and I definitely want to assert something like that. All I want to deny is that um, is that, that process can be completely under our control in the same way that the first order processes are. Hmm. So... Um, and, and, and um, if we get around to, to reading the Carmides, um, 
other platonic dialogue that I that I put on uh, the syllabus, um, I think that's a really beautiful place to to talk about this. Um, so one might think, uh, well, okay, the best thing would be if we just knew everything. Uh, so uh, there would just be knowledge. We don't have that. There's also some ignorance. But if we can rise up to a second level and observe our knowing and not knowing, then we would effectively um, plug the hole or at least localize the problem of not knowing. Um, and it's that that I am concerned to deny that diagonalization gives us a, a power for. It's not, uh, it is not, um, it's not a mechanical tool for being able to identify our knowledge and our ignorance. It's something like a form that lets us observe that we have this kind of problem um, and delivers both some globally bad news and occasionally, with good luck, um, some local insights. Um, but it does not give us a way of uh, simply controlling by means of a second order observation um, the problems that, that arise in our own uh, negotiation of, of our ignorance. Does that... Um, so, uh, so better to, better to think of it as an event uh, in which an emergence is possible, yes, but necessarily involving some chance, necessarily involving some good luck. Um, if, if we had time, I'd, I would point to, to the end of, of uh, the Mino precisely as uh, an additional um, adumbration of, of the uh, okay. inex inexpungible role of good luck in the thing that we're trying to get in some sort of metacognition that, that would have value for us ethically. Um, that whole thing about, about virtue being a gift of the gods, um, probably, not, uh, probably not worth taking literally, but probably um, worth... Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, that's great. I, it's 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 a it's a good place to start. You know, I, I I'll think around that what, what you just said. Um, I appreciate you addressing that for a moment. It, it's also it's also uh, ju just to do one more classical allusion. It's also deeply. Um, connected to the whole question of Socratic ignorance and Socratic irony, right? So Socrates says, Socrates is doing something that is a second order cognitive operation, right? He's uh, making it possible under some circumstances for us to observe our ignorance. Now how does he do it? Does he do it as uh, many of his interlocutors uh, seem to think? Does he do it by just having a good trick, um, which is an algorithm being applied at, at that second order level um, and uh, just sort of um, ungenerously keeping it to himself. Um, he denies that he does so, right? He denies that he exposes ignorance because he has knowledge. Um, he says in instead that he exposes ignorance because he participates in ignorance. Um, something like that, um, if, if diagonalization could speak to us, it, I. Uh, suggest that it would say about itself um, something like that, and, and that uh, looking at this form helps to vindicate what's too easily written off as Socratic irony. Um, I don't think it's, it's uh, sheerly ironic uh, or in any way disingenuous that, that Socrates says uh, he's doing what he's doing by an active deployment of not knowing. Um, so what happens up here um, doesn't in uh, a sort of uh, cartoon Hegel Hegelian fashion doesn't neutralize uh, ignorance by inscribing a higher order knowledge of knowledge and ignorance. Rather, it in some way participates in both of these and enables us to orient ourselves inside a space that is now um, ramified in, in two dimensions. Um, but in each case involving, in each of those dimensions, involving both knowledge and ignorance. Okay.
Let's talk about um, contours diagonalization just to make sure that we get to it. And if we're, since we're having a seminar on uh, on diagonalization per se, I think it's a good idea to have a real example of it uh, in common at our first meeting. Um, and then um, we can, in the time that remains, um, discuss uh, all of the important context around uh, around that result in the contour. Does that sound good? Sounds like a good plan. For the okay. Last hour. Okay. So um, diagonalization shows up in the 1891 paper on an elementary question in the theory of manifolds. That's on page 920 of uh, the From Kant to Hilbert's selections. And we don't have to uh, do it in precisely uh, the notation uh, that we've got it here. In fact, translating it into a more modern notation will give us uh, the opportunity to just review some basic set theoretic stuff. Um, nevertheless, the claim on the table here is quite large, um, and there are many ways of putting it. Um, we have here at least certainly the discovery that there are um, infinite sets of, as Contra says, different powers or different sizes. The infinite philosophically has long been used, I suggest, to play a certain kind of double game. Let me see if I can state it succinctly. And we see this even in Contra's own remarks, which, which um, goes to the eventual character of, of diagonalization in, in the way that, that we need it to get the concepts that would enable us to receive it uh, without distortion the future anterior. Um, perhaps we could put it this way. And I'll ask whether this um, gives a good representation of your philosophical experience. It seems to me that through most of the history of philosophy and persisting in certain contemporary tendencies as well, unless one goes through great efforts to, to root it out and to think through the consequences of this stuff. There is a tendency to use the infinite as a kind of um, stopgap for our worst philosophical problems. And the way that this would work, the, the reason that I call it rather arbitrarily a double game, uh, is because one would regard the infinite as a concept with two sides. One side in which it's um, the maximum of difference from everything finite. the infinite would be maximally different from everything else, everything else being collectively the finite. And at the same time, in this uh, traditional deployment that um, I think we can recognize in a post-Cantorian context as kind of dishonest, but uh, we'll get there. At the same time, there's a tendency to regard it as maximally self-identical. To put it in a, a, a very uh, sweeping, oversimplified, 
historical context, going back to that discussion about uh, the horror of the void and of infinite regress, it's as if um, there was that moment of horror and then uh, people kind of got over it and realized, okay, we can actually use this to our advantage. Um, we can, on the one hand, uh, keep the infinite immune from rational inquiry on the grounds that it's so different from everything else that there is no common measure between us and it. And on the other hand, you can use the, that very same uh, gesture of a one-shot difference between the infinite and the finite um, to assert uh, that the infinite is, the fi is a figure of the perfect, is a figure of self-identity, um, such that even if we don't have to understand it, it can nevertheless in itself absorb uh, all of our uh, paradoxes and problems uh, into itself and resolve them there. Um, one might think of, of what uh, Deleuze refers to as the orgiastic style of, of representational thinking, um, indebted to Leibniz and Hegel along these lines, um, sort of try and, and recover uh, some of the, the differentiating power of the infinite uh, no longer as a moment of horror, but as a reassurance, precisely one of these reassurances on a higher level um, that I'm uh, suggesting we need to think our, our way out of. So if this is something like the traditional deployment of the concept of the infinite, my suggestion is um, the first of our big consequences of diagonalization is that with Contour, that must come to an end. Whatever we do with the infinite af after Contour, um, we can no longer, um, in good faith, uh, if it ever was possible in good faith, uh, we can no longer play this game. Um, why? Why? Um, because we can no longer think of the infinite as self-identical, and we can no longer think of it as the figure of a, ma a maximum. Um, th those two... Uh, conditions would go together, right? If there is an absolute maximum there, then it's identical to itself. Um, and if it is self-identical, self um, then that's because there's no possibility or motivation for, for going beyond it. Um, so when Badiou, for example, talks about the Cantorian revolution, he certainly does not mean what Cantor uh, thought or desired or was inclined to uh, think of as, as the significance of his own results. Um, what I think he he means by a Cantorian revolution is that the infinite uh, is rationally accessible but neither maximal nor self-identical. Now, if you're going to show that it's not maximal or self-identical, uh, what do you have to show? You have to show that that there's an uh, that the infinite is c cannot be. Um, so, so if you had if you had the figure of infinite descent before, right, of the abyss, uh, there's a temptation to say, okay, we can just take one step back and think of in some reflective way, that abyss itself as a final point of arrival. Well, what Contra shows us is, is that we can't do that. Um, there, there's an internal division to the infinite that can't be overcome. Um, and the site of that internal division um, is just a repetition at a higher order of uh, the site of the problem that caused so much uh, trouble for Greek mathematics, namely the relation between the discrete and the continuous. Nevertheless, Contra shows even more than this um, so don't make the mistake, as some people do, of thinking uh, that it's possible to just stop here and uh, perform the same trick again, assert that the mysteries of the continuum are somehow um, themselves the, uh, the trace of a full metaphysical presence that isn't internally divided. Um, if I were to 
speak critically of Purse, which I do with fear and trembling because Purse is much smarter than I am, I think that's the mistake that he's made um, in that, that piece um, that I've excerpted for you. Um, on the other hand, to emphasize um, the side of rational access, One way, um, for example, for people with a background in Heidegger to understand what was so disruptive and reorienting about Badiou is that he doesn't, he doesn't put it this way, but, but we could put it this way. The internal division that he indicates in the structure of any situation, the structure of any presented multiplicity, to, to use the language of, of being an event, but, um, somewhat misleadingly, I think, referred to as the gap between its presentation and its uh, representation. But we could call it a, a difference between uh, what is explicit and implicit in uh, presentation itself. Is something like an internal division bet it, w within um, what uh, people working in a, in a Heideggerian idiom um, might think of in terms of presence. So, on the one hand, you have, um, as a consequence of, of the Cantorian Revolution, um, you have an ineradicable division, an ineradicable split, even in the infinite, that you can't use the infinite as, as a token for, for uh, postulating a, a halt to. But on the other hand, you have that division isn't between presence and something else. It's a division within presence, and therefore it's in a way much more uh, accessible, uh, certainly much more rationally accessible than uh, phenomenologically inflected uh, critiques of presence would have it. Detotalization is rationally articulable. That, that's that's the claim. Okay. Does anyone um, feel like they have a good enough intuition of the proof to to want to uh, begin the discussion about it instead of me? Uh, that would be fine. Otherwise, I uh, would be glad to do so. It strikes me this uh, gap in presence. Excuse me, I'm sorry, it's not directly related, but sure. <laughs> this is a sort of Lacanian uh, ontological uh, uh, or ontology of the whole. It's sort of essential to the picture and Lacan and how bad do grafts uh, um, what unattainable desire to the void set as a picture of the subject, something like that. <laughs> um, this is the intervention into Heidegger you were talking about. <clears throat> Why Badu disagrees fundamentally with Heidegger is because of this gap. <clears throat> and and yet, so so I think the the gap is intended to be a generalization and uh, a uh, rescuing uh, both of uh, the Lacanian split, but also very just as explicitly of ontological difference. Right. Um, what makes it such a weird mashup um, is uh, is that he's appealing uh, to Contra's work in order to make those uh, thinkable together and and thinkable rationally. Yeah. Um, so rather than than saying um, as Heidegger would 
that whatever we do formally, uh, certainly whatever we do in, in mathematics, isn't going to get us uh, to. Um, it, it's just going to. It's just going to make it more difficult to notice ontological difference unless we take some kind of leap. Um, here he proposes to identify ontological difference um, precisely with what it is that uh, that Contra shows here, namely uh, the difference between set and power set. So you're saying, so Badiou identifies this difference with what Heidegger would call the ontological difference. I think so, beings yeah. Beings and being. Yeah. Um, at, at the cost of, of uh, dis disemphasizing some things in favor of others, but I, I think it's intended to be a reconstruction of ontological difference. Um, yeah. So, the important thing is to figure out um, how it could be rationally thinkable that the infinite is not one. And to notice the little undramatic, almost technical trick called diagonalization that gives it to us. As um, the editor's note in the Contour um, that you're reading, this is not Contour's first proof that the powers of countable infinity, 1, 2, 3, etc., infinity, and the power of the continuum are different. Um, his first proof, however, um, relies on positively noticing uh, special features of the continuum. This later, shorter, uh, much more powerful proof does not, and is in fact completely general, and it doesn't stop at the continuum. Um, it shows us that if we have a set S, then let's call the power set of S has strictly greater cardinality, um, which is to say uh, size, than that of the original set. There's good reason um, to identify this size as the size 2 to the s. So we would have 2 to the s is strictly greater than s, regardless of what s uh, you start with. irrespective, in particular, of whether the S that you start with is finite or infinite. So just to review, what are we talking about when we refer to sets and power sets? We'll take a toy example. A set is an undefined term in set theory for good reasons. As we'll see, if you try to define a set, then you can use the definition of a set to construct Russell's paradox. Um, but intuitively, a set would be a collection of things between brackets, counted as one, as Beju likes to say, borrowing terminology that is at least there in Russell, if not before. Um, so it's some kind of many counted as one. The platonic overtones are, are evident, and Contra even uh, points them out. Um, in the case of a finite set, uh, you could give that explicitly. So you could say the set S is the set consisting of the three elements A, B, and C. If one wants to assert that an element belongs to a set, you can just write it like this. A is an element of the set S. So, 
talking in terms of sets, seems like a, a, a nice, straightforward, semi-mathematical way of talking about situations, which is exactly the use that, that Bedu puts it to, right? Suppose you want to say what there is, what is there in a given situation. Um, in principle, you can think of it as being a set, whether defined extensionally by just listing off the elements as given here, or defined intentionally um, by naming some property. So you could say the set R is the set of all x such that x is red. This bar, or sometimes a colon, uh, is used here, is red such that, which if any of you are Agamemnon fans, is literally the place uh, to articulate that uh, crazy being such um, in the coming community and related works. Um, being such would be something like the border between extensions and intentions, not doing something intentionally, but intentions with an S. An intention is something like a property or a characteristic. The extension is all of the things that are picked out by that property or characteristic. Um, thinking uh, too naively about the relation between extensions and intentions gets one into a lot of trouble. One way of understanding what it is the Contrast Theorem is, is showing, which doesn't seem to have anything to do with uh, sets, infinite sets and their, and their sizes, even though it really does, is it's showing you that you can't ultimately assemble intentions and extensions into um, a final coherent system. More on that when we talk about the, the form in which this reappears um, relative to Russell and Frege. All right, so two different ways of defining sets. If, if you're um, uh, dealing with a finite set, you can be lucky enough to just name its members. Um, Sometimes you can kind of cheat and uh, say the set one, two, three, dot, 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 where the dot, dot, dot really means we're defining it intentionally, but we're supposing that we're intelligent enough to have grasped what the rule is that defines uh, membership. Um, but in general, if you're talking about an infinite set, you're going to have to define it intentionally. You're going to have to define it according to some kind of criterion and then refer to everything uh, that satisfies that criterion. Um, so back to the notion of situations for a second, right? Um, it seems like this is the most straightforward, banal way that you could possibly say, that you could possibly describe a situation. However, one way of thinking about this split is to say, whenever you say what there is in a set, you've said not just one thing, but two. And the two of them don't line up exactly. Um, so this will give us the notion of the power set. I would hear power not in the sense of force, but in the sense of potentiality. Agamben again, um, difference between potestas and potentia. Um, I'll make many more references to Badu than to Agamben here, but um, one of the reasons I became convinced that diagonalization was the site that I had to look at specifically was noticing um, the forms that uh, were in common between Badu's talk of the event and Agamben's talk of potentiality. Um, so I would, hear, I would hear the power of power set in terms of potentiality, not in terms of, uh, of force. Um, what is the power set? Well, it's, in a certain sense, the unpacking of the potential of the set that you've got. So if we start out with a toy set, S, where we say all that's there is A, B, C, A, B, and C, then the power set of S, which is, in a certain sense, co-given, a phenomenologist might say, along with S, but not in the same way, is the set of all subsets of S.
So, if this isn't too uh, painfully obvious, um, somebody actually tell me this. Uh, what is the power set of our toy set S that we've got here? Would it be A, B, C, uh, B, C, A, C? Okay. And a, so we've got the whole thing. The whole is, is just one of the parts from this perspective. And then, as you said, we've got A, B, B, C, A, C, then we've got the singletons, the parts that are only one member large, A, B, C, and one more. The empty set. The empty set. Why? Um, it's not a member of every set. Yes. Why? <laughs> hmm. Good question. I don't um, know. That was the rules. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so that's true, and there's no denying that we could have defined it differently, right? We could have defined the empty set out of the subset. Here's a quick heuristic argument that we shouldn't have done so and that we were right to keep it in. What this, um, what counting it in, so uh, if we say that the power set includes all of these, including the empty set, what that really um, gives us is the sense that set membership should be determined locally. It should be determined element by element. Just by asking about each element, the question, so we'll take a particular element, take the element A, and we'll simply ask, is it an element of S? Uh, I'm sorry, is it an element of um, some particular subset? Uh, X, then there are two answers that you can give, right? You can say yes, or you can say no. And both of those answers should be equally good, and we should be able to use any combination of answers to specify a subset. And in that case, the answer yes, 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 and the answer no, 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 have to be treated on an equal footing as all of the others. Um, Bedu, of course, um, makes much phenomenological and poetic hay out of um, the uh, potential interpretation of this belonging of the void or the belonging of the empty set to every situation. Um, but if one just wanted a, a, a non-fraught uh, sort of technical um, system designing type answer to why we should believe that before we go on to say what it could possibly signify philosophically, um, it would be this one. Um, it's the principle, uh, a version of, of the principle of extensionality um, that uh, set membership should be defined locally. That means that the elements are, in a deep sense, independent of one another. And whether that makes set theory an awkward uh, instrument for talking about true structures is something that we should probably come back to, especially in the relation between uh, set theory and category theory. Um, nevertheless, uh, even though um, we just said sets are supposed to be kind of structureless, notice that the power set is already a structure, and a structure of a particular kind. It forms a lattice of inclusions um, where Let's see, A is in AB, and it's in AC, B is in BC, and AB, C is in etc. the empty set is in everything. So it forms a, a kind of network um, of potential inclusions that flow up from the empty set, which is part of everything, up to the repetition of the whole set, which sort of receives them all. Um, if you see an analogy between that and truth values, where we think of, of truth as, in a certain sense, flowing from the false to the true, um, then you're already thinking in a kind of category theoretic uh, framework, um, where the false functions as an initial object and the true functions as a terminal object. If that sounds weird, um, just think about it in terms of uh, standard understanding of, of implication, if A then B, um, 
the false is supposed to imply anything, makes an, an initial object source that's giving everything out. Uh, and on the other hand, the true is supposed to be implied by everything, makes it a sink uh, where all, all of the lines go, in, go into. Um, it, it's, uh, it's kind of like um, magnetic field lines, uh, although I never remember uh, which pole is the source and which one is the sink. Um, <clears throat> So, um, in addition to justifying the presence of the empty set here, we've also justified our uh, notation uh, 2 to the s, or 2 to the size of s, for the size of the power set by uh, using this principle of uh, determining subsets by asking, in order of each element, uh, is A in the subset, is B in the subset, is C in the subset? two answers to this, then at each node you have two answers to the B question, then at each node you have two answers to the C question. Um, so where your two to the whatever comes from is just uh, that you're working in um, a binary logic where there are only tr two truth values, one and zero, yes and no, and you're asking that about all of the elements in the original set. And that gives you a map for determining where you are in sort of subset space. So I know we're almost out of time, so I'm going to do uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, go over the proof quickly uh, because I want real diagonalization to be on the table, and then we can talk more about its implications next time. But I want us all. Uh, Pais Menonos to be able to point to something in our proof and say the diagonal is there. Um, <clears throat> so Contra's theorem. From which it follows, if you are Bedou or Grimm, that there is no God and that there is no universe. Contra's theorem. <laughs> power set of S size of the power set of S, which is 2 to the size of S, is strictly greater than the size of S. Or if you like, just write it as though we were doing ordinary algebra, 2 to the x is strictly bigger than x, even if x is infinite. As always in this family of results, proof by contradiction. So we'll probably start next time by, by recalling uh, this proof um, so that we don't just do it too quickly and once um, and then branch into the philosophy from there. So what do we need to assert in order to get equality? How would we get 2 to the x equal to x? Well, when dealing with the infinite, the notion of equality that we've got going here is that of what is unfortunately called a one-to-one -one correspondence. Or sometimes a bijection. So it's a way of comparing the size of sets by pairing off their elements one with another. What makes infinite sets interesting is that you can have a perfectly good one-to-one -one correspondence between a set and a subset of itself, as um, Galileo and before him Nicholas of Cusa and other uh, ancient and medieval uh, thinkers pointed out, um, but Dedekind and Cantor were the first to affirm as a definition of the infinite. Um, the Galilean property. You can, for example, pair off all of the natural numbers with their squares. 1 to 1, 2 to 4, 3 to 9. These are a subset of these. They all occur within the list over here, but in the sense of a 1 to 1 correspondence, there are just as many of the one as the other. That looks on the face of it like it reinforces, and it does up to a certain point, that traditional double game of the infinite, where the infinite would be a sort of magical machine for absorbing all of difference and turning it into identity. If you can do this, it looks like you should be able to absorb any difference. And indeed, 
the cardinal mathematics of the infinite is pretty boring until you reach the point of the exponential. Um, why that is philosophically, what this really refers to philosophically is I think a, ma a major question for us. Um, but if you were to take uh, the ordinary uh, infinity of the counting numbers, one, two, three, etc., cetera, um, which you could call uh, as an ordinal omega sub zero, or as a cardinal, you could call it, um, my aleph isn't going to be very good, um, aleph sub zero, as Contra did. Um, either way, we're just referring to uh, plain old infinity, the kind of infinity uh, that you would often write that way in uh, middle school. Um, the arithmetic of the infinite um, looks like it plays on uh, this defining property, being able to put uh, an infinite set into one, one correspondence with a subset of itself, um, precisely to reinforce the double game of the infinite. And indeed, if you take the ordinary infinite and, cardinally speaking, uh, add one to it, uh, it'll return itself. If you take the ordinary infinite and multiply it by two, it'll return itself. If you take the ordinary infinite and raise it to a power, it will return itself, all of which uh, are rigorously provable. Um, and we're doing this in a cardinal sense, which is to say we're talking only about size. If we were talking about position, uh, then there are subtleties in which um, the ordinal omega uh, sub zero is uh, going to be a different, it's going to have a different outcome whether you put the one at the beginning and then add omega sub zero, in which case you're going to get omega sub zero, or if you take omega sub zero first and then add one, in which you're going to, in case you're going to get a new ordinal, which Contra calls omega sub zero plus one. Um, however, cardinally, which is to say just in terms of absolute size, which is what we're talking about at the moment, um, these are equal. So uh, let's not worry about ordinals. Um, they are sneaky, and I don't fully trust them under any circumstances. Um, <clears throat> right. So, um, the hypothesis for reductio, the thing that is going to turn out to be false, that we are going to assume to be true, in order to derive a contradiction, is very simple. Our hypothesis is that there's going to be some set S, presumably an infinite one, but we're not even going to bother to say that, that can be put into one-to-one -one correspondence with its power set, the set of all subsets of S. Now, if you've never done this before, it may seem complicated. I, my uh, electronic door is permanently open to anyone who's participating in this seminar for the duration to work through this enough times that the startling simplicity of it um, comes to be what strikes you rather than maybe the initial terminological complexity. Uh, because that's what's really um, incredibly striking here is how simple the proof is. Most of it is just going to be unpacking what we meant by the false hypothesis. Um, so let's do that really quickly. Let's give the one-to-one -one correspondence a name. Since it's a function, we'll call it f. So we will have f being a one-to-one -one correspondence between s and the power set of s. Now, what's that going to look like? Well, let's take an element of S here. We'll call it X. 
we'll take an element of the power set here, and if f is the function that's pairing these off, then we'll reasonably refer to this as f of x, just as you did in high school algebra. Can we improve this picture at all? Can we draw a better picture? A more informative picture? Right now, as we've got it, S and what it's being paired up with, its, it's partner could be anything, right? Its partner could be the set called Bob, and we would still have the same picture of F pairing up the elements of S with the elements of Bob. Um, in other words, we're not making use of the fact that there's any internal connection between what it is to be S and what it is to be the power set of S. Is there a way that we could fix that? Well, we could, rather than drawing S and P of S, we could draw S twice. But then we wouldn't be able to just draw a dot over here. and We're not pairing S up with itself, element by element. What would we have to draw over here? We would have to draw a subset. So let's draw it as this squiggly region. But remember, the elements of the power set just are the subsets of S. So we have the same information in this diagram. And again, we can refer to the subset itself as F of X, just bearing in mind that that's now uh, a part and not a point element. Can we improve the picture? We can. We've now drawn an S twice. Why bother? Why not just draw it once? And then we will have our region, our point, and F will be an arrow from S to itself with x a point, and f of x a region. Now at this point, unless we are being careful about how we read the diagram, we are on the verge of making a mistake and inscribing more information than we are actually entitled to inscribe into the picture. Do you see how so? Region. I guess I'm, I'm... Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Well, I guess my, my concern is that um, it appears that that the power... What we're mapping it on to something smaller than itself. I mean, the way we've drawn it, right? You have this squiggly region, which is smaller. It's contained inside S. Ah, um, but it's bigger than X. X, X is what's be So X, an element of our original set, is being mapped to an entire subset of S. So um, to go back. To okay, our... so you're you're saying you're the, in this picture, S really only has one element. No, um, that's just one that, that we've picked out to show how the arrow works. Thank you for asking these questions. So let's go back to our toy set for a minute, right? When S was a, B, C, and we know what its power set was. Um, an instance of this arrow, then, might be one where we take the element, A, and say it gets paired up with the subset, B, C. Okay. All right. I follow. Now... The mistake that we're on the verge of making, um, that we can head ourselves off from making, 
is just this. Once we combine these into one diagram, when I draw the arrow, even if only as an illustration, I have to make a choice. Am I going to draw x in here, inside the subset that it's paired with, or am I going to draw it the way that I did the first time, outside that subset? Either is perfectly possible. The thing that we have to realize is that, in general, our pairing function f is going to include both types of such pairings. So we observe for any given f, sometimes x is an element of the subset that it's paired with, f of x, and sometimes it isn't. This is the first overt instance of something like self-reference or self-application, a pervasive theme that accompanies diagonalization that we will have encountered. The self-reference is much uh, sort of more on the surface when we deal with uh, the proof of the incompleteness theorem, but it's here too. Um, the random person named Grelling um, put some nice names on a version of this distinction. Uh, Grelling didn't deal with elements and subsets. Dealing, Grelling pardon me, Grelling just dealt with words. And Grelling said there are words of two different kinds. Those that describe themselves, which he called autological, and those that don't, which he called heterological. Your, so your, your log root just indicating a word, auto, self, hetero, other. So for example, for Grelling, English is autological because English is English. English is heterological because it means English, but it's not English. Um, Polysyllabic is autological because polysyllabic is polysyllabic, but monosyllabic is heterological because monosyllabic is not monosyllabic. This sounds like it's verging into sort of dangerously smallian like logic puzzle territory, and it is, minus the connotation of disapproval surrounding the, the dangerously. Um, so on one hand, this is just a weird game, and on the other hand, it is um, something that turns out to be remarkably conceptually central to all sorts of philosophical problems. Um, nevertheless, I'm aware that we're running out of time, so I, I'm not going to pause on all the different ways that we could interpret this difference. Let's keep that on the table for next time. How should we think about... Uh, this difference, um, the difference between the autological and the heterological and what it describes. At any rate, what we have to notice is that our putative pairing function involves both kinds of pairs, pairings that are uh, self-membered or uh, autological in Grelling's sense, pairings that are non-self-membered or heterological in uh, Grelling's sense. I can't resist uh, just saying in terms of large consequences of, of this way of thinking, this is Bedu's model for the difference between nature and history. Um, and it is uh, the model in Lacan and Agamben um, for language itself. Um, so uh, what, what Bedu calls a historical multiple is one in which uh, the name forms a part of the thing. Uh, there isn't a French Revolution uh, until 
uh, arguably someone comes along and identifies a whole bunch of empirical things that are going on as having something in common, names it the French Revolution, uh, the name becomes a part of what it uh, purports to be describing, and probably, uh, at least from what we know of, say, fundamental physics, things at the uh, most basic level of, level of reality, as far as we know, don't seem to be like this. Self-reference seems to bottom out somewhere. Uh, this is another deep question that's going to reappear uh, with Gödel. Should we posit that there is an end, uh, that there is or that there has to be, as, as I even suspect, an end to self-reference in order to make self-reference possible? Um, nevertheless, okay, um, we've got almost everything. Um, here, the rest of the proof will take 30 seconds. Probably a little more. Um, if you're worried about one of these classes being empty, don't worry about it. Um, you can convince yourself easily that uh, the distinction is valid, even if one of these sometimes happens to be no time at all. Um, so it'll just mean that the empty set would play a role in our proof. The next step. Consider... all of the heterological elements, which is to say, consider all of the x's in S such that x is not an element of the subset that it is paired with. This move is sometimes called uh, diagonalization. Core. Um, that's not exactly how I like uh, to uh, use the term, um, but let's say um, in a slightly less misleading way, this, all of the, he the set of all of the heterological elements in our pairing um, is what is legitimately named the diagonal subset. And it's the one that's going to cause the problems and all of the interesting things. Name this diagonal subset big D. So go back to our, our two-step picture here, where we have S and the power set of S. Big D is an element of the power set of S, right? Now. By hypothesis, that means it needs a partner. It needs something to be paired up with, according to our one-to-one -one correspondence, F. Call that, for the sake of convenience, little d. And remember that in addition to drawing it this way, we could also draw it this way, where we draw S for a second time. We say big D is a region. And then the question very naturally arises, the question that arises whenever we try to combine these into one diagram. Namely, is it inside or is it outside? Is little d an element of big D? So is it in here? Or is it out here? Question mark. We don't know which. The problem, of course, is that either is contradictory. Suppose yes. Suppose it is. D is, by definition, the set of all x in S, such that x is not in f of x. So, if little d is in big D, little d has this property. Plug in little d here. Little d is not an element of f of little d. Little d is not an element of big D. So, if it is, it isn't. Contradiction. On the other hand, suppose no. Suppose little d is not an element of big D. We remind ourselves of the same definition. 
over here. That definition is clearly satisfied by little d now. So little d is an element of f of little d. Little d is an element of big D. So if it's in, then it's out. And if it's out, then it's in. This is the substance of our contradiction. Perfectly symmetric contradiction on both sides. We're going to see um, in a week or two that the way you get Gerdelian incompleteness is actually by breaking this symmetry between the two cases and, and putting uh, that broken symmetry to productive use. Um, but for right now, when we're just getting a straight contradiction, um, it's the symmetric form of, of the alternatives for locating little d um, that, uh, that appeals to us. In, in, um, in Grelling's formulation, little d would be the word heterological. The way of formulating this contradiction would be to ask, is heterological heterological? Well, if it is, then it isn't. And if it isn't, then it is. Um, Plato seems to uh, arrive at a very uh, similar point when considering something like the difference itself, where itselfness indicates the self-identity of a form, well, the form of the different, or the different itself, to the extent that it's self-identical, should be different, and to the extent that it's different, should be self-identical. Um, that um, sounds uh, very much like it leaves open the double game of the infinite, but this slightly more refined Cantorian form does not, because what we've proven by reductio is that f does not exist. F, as, as we posited it, F as a one-to-one -one correspondence, does not exist. You can spin that positively or negatively, and I'll, I'll stop after this sentence, I promise. Um, you can spin it positively or negatively. Um, so you can say that this is an observation about F, which is defined to be a one-to-one -one correspondence. Namely, that it doesn't exist. Or you can just as well say it's an observation about any f, any pairing that you could set up that could exist between uh, set and power set. And in that case, what you've shown is that it can't be a one-to-one -one correspondence. There aren't enough uh, names, there aren't enough elements in the set to cover the power set. There aren't enough names to cover the parts. Um, and this is that reservoir of unnamed potential that Badiou argues is mathematically there just in the structure of any situation. Because on one hand, when you've got the situation as a set, you also, in a certain sense, have got the power set there too. But the two are fundamentally unequal. So every situation is internally divided take it in the Lacanian direction or take it in the Heideggerian direction and call it ontological difference, uh, you, could do, you could do either. But what it prohibits is using the infinite as a means of uh, seeming to acknowledge this difference and then, in fact, shutting it down. Um, I am going to stop there, but I am more than happy to... Uh, stay and discuss things with uh, any of you patient people. That was amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> Thank you for saying so. I, I'm, I'm sure it was pretty spastic, but... Um, Beautiful. As, as we, unbelievable. Thank as, you. We get, as we get, get used to each other, um, we'll hopefully settle into, <laughs> into more of a conversation. Any final questions? Not for me. I'll just also agree that that was great, very inspiring. Um, I do have to go, but uh, I hope to have more of a conversation on the classroom page this week. Um,
Yes, please. Yeah, cool. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Bye, everyone. See you, sir. Bye. Bye. John, if I could ask you to just to for next session, maybe give a give a, a little bit of what you want to focus on for the readings. I mean, I know you already posted oh, yes. them, but it's just good to re review them. But. Yes. Um, so this is not enough to say about Condor's theorem. Um, we should pick it up um, with this modicum of familiarity that we developed in, in this discussion and really nail it down next time. And uh, we should talk about the use of this uh, that's made um, by Badu, by Grimm, um, we might as well include the priest um, to get a dissenting view. Um, so I, I'm I'm pushing a sort of Bajusian and grim line about how we should understand uh, the consequences of diagonalization with a strong accent on detotalization. Um, we should get the strongest possible objection to that, um, which seems to be priests, um, on the table next time as well. And, uh, and the purse... Um, all, all of those we should do. So everything, okay. everything we had, uh, everything we had for this time, except the Mino, um, and I'll probably inveterately refer back to that a dozen times anyway. Okay, I, then I would, I would propose that. I mean, it doesn't have to be. But I'm just proposing this as an idea that maybe we could use the classroom to kind of pick certain texts that we liked, and then we can all present on it next next session as well. I would love that. Yeah, because if we can split, we, maybe we could split up the text with each, with with a few people if they're gonna if they're gonna be here next week. But that that would be great, and and you wouldn't have to do much in each case. It it could be five or ten minutes, just as a just as a means of uh of making uh each of you the most vocal person for a few minutes, um and getting me to shut up. Yeah, exactly. And plus, yeah. So I'm gonna end, but. <laughs>